Mariana mentioned our project. I'm going to give a summary, an overview of what the project is about, uh, and I'm only going to focus on my contributions to the project. Uh, I, I think you're all pretty familiar with Mariana's contributions, which are all the innovation part. Uh, my part is the macro money financial part of the project. So we are focusing on, I think, uh, three of the greatest 20th century economists, Keynes, Schumpeter, and Minsky. So let me very briefly talk about what each one of those contributes to our, uh, the basis of our project. So first from Keynes, the central insight is the theory of effective demand. Um, and the idea here is that firms hire the, here is the one sentence summary of the general theory. Uh, firms hire the amount of labor they think they need to produce the amount of output they think they can sell. That is the fundamental basis of Keynes' thought. Um, employment is not determined in labor markets. So if you have unemployment, the problem is not in the labor market. The problem is in effective demand. So the solution cannot be found in the labor market. In other words, it can't be found by training or motivating the workforce. The solution is in increasing effective demand. Uh, and finally, Keynes's rejection of loanable funds theory, which unfortunately is still the dominant view in economics and also in policy making, which is that we need to promote saving in order to provide the finance of investment. This is fundamentally flawed, as Keynes showed well over uh, half a century ago. Um, and finally, from Keynes, specifically, we take the investment theory of the cycle, although uh, I'm going to um, have some caveats about uh, that, but you'll see how this fits in with what we're doing. Okay, Schumpeter. So the, uh, from Schumpeter, we borrow two insights, the link between the innovation process and the dynamics of the capitalist system, um, and second, his argument that innovation needs finance. Those who are familiar with Schumpeter will remember that he argues that um, within a circular flow, we have a revolving fund to finance. We don't actually need the banks to play an important role. But banks have to play an important role in innovation because innovation is un undertaken by entrepreneurs who don't already have the sales. It's a new idea. It has to be financed by the bankers who are the efforts of capitalism because they finance the innovation, okay? Um, we need to, to modify, this is very obvious still in the case of startups, but we need to modify it because as we know from the work of Mar people like Mariana and uh, Bill, uh, in the case of large firms, there's a lot of innovation and they do have the internal funds to finance that, okay? Um, however, the uh, insight that we're adding here is that actually all production has to be financed by the efforts, the bankers, uh, not just innovation. Schumpeter, I think, had this wrong, and I'll come back to this in just a second. And then finally, the role of the entrepreneurial state. Um, Minsky's uh, contributions are, first, the forces of the capitalist system are not stabilizing. They are fundamentally destabilizing. So Minsky's view is very different from the orthodox view, which is that the forces are stabilizing, but you get shocks or you get government intervention that prevents you from moving to the point of equilibrium. Minsky argued, no, that's fundamentally wrong. The forces are destabilizing. And what we have is constraints on the instability that are put in place. Um, Minsky broadened Schumpeter's view. It's not simply finance for investment for innovation as investment in total is typically at least partially externally financed. So even investment that has nothing to do with the innovation process needs finance and at least some of that comes externally. So this is Minsky's uh, contribution to the, the, the work of his dissertation supervisor who was Schumpeter. Um, we can go further than that and say that all production has to be financed uh, and, so, and so we can borrow this idea from Marx and from Keynes and from Veblen, which is that production always starts with money in order to produce and sell for more money in prime at the end of the process. So production itself is fundamentally a monetary process, beginning with money to end up with more money at the end. 
Um, finance itself is subject to innovation. So again, this was Minsky's uh, extension of the work of his dissertation supervisor. For Schumpeter ignored the innovation in the financial process itself. So finance funded innovation, but Minsky said, hold it, banks also innovate. And that's very important, and it's fundamental to his theory of financial instability. Finally, stability is destabilizing. If you ever actually manage to achieve stability of the economy, that itself is destabilizing because it changes expectations and behavior in a way that you will have financial fragility and a financial crisis. Um, and this is mainly due to the innovations in finance that are encouraged by the appearance of stability. I'll come back to this in just a second. Okay, if we go through Minsky's early contributions, if we look in the uh, 1950s, uh, his arguments were innovation is endogenous, it responds to profit opportunity. Um, so he looked at specifically the creation of the Fed funds market in the United States, which was a way to get around the constraints the Fed was trying to put on bank creation of money. Um, and he developed an endogenous money supply theory in the 50s. The innovation, however, stretches liquidity and increases fragility, and that reduces the margins of safety that are built in um, to the financial process. You get a crisis, but then the big bank, which is the central bank, and the big government, which is the treasury, intervene to prevent a debt deflation process like we had in the 1930s from occurring. And so that intervention validates those financial innovations that stretched liquidity and made the system unstable. Uh, he uh, worked with uh, Samuelson, this is only for the economists here, <laughs> multiplier accelerator model, which we know can be explosive depending on the parameters of the system, and he showed that if you put in ceilings and floors, you can constrain the instability. So Minsky is, is fundamentally pessimistic in the sense that capitalism is unstable, but we can put in ceilings and floors to constrain the instability. What are the ceilings and floors? Finan uh, sorry, they are uh, uh, institutions, regulations, supervision of the financial institutions, all of those things help to constrain the instability. The institutions of the early post-war economy, so these are the ceilings and floors, promoted stability. The problem is stability is destabilizing. Okay, so we had the appearance of stability in the early post-war period, but that would change behavior in a way that instability would rise again. In the 1960s and 70s, this is the work that is best known uh, by Minsky. Uh, he developed, I won't go through all of this, but he developed the financial instability hypothesis. And uh, yesterday, Adair Turner, when he summarized Minsky very briefly in response to my question, he was presenting Minsky 1970s view, um, in which the, the instability is caused, uh, this is extremely brief summary, uh, by the financing of investment. And uh, Adair Turner correctly said, that doesn't really fit what's been going on. The instability that we've had in our economies in the past 30 years actually have not had much to do with investment by firms. That's correct. Okay, <clears throat> I'll come back to that. The policy problem, Minsky said, is that stability can't be achieved because it changes behavior in ways that make it, which is the Great Depression debt deflation uh, process, likely again. The policy problem is to devise <coughs> institutional structures that make it less likely that it will happen again. The relative stability of the post-war period led to the development of a much more unstable version of capitalism. So the uh, other extension of Minsky to Schumpeter was to go back to Schumpeter's stages approach and apply that to the transformation of the capitalist economies over the post-war period. So uh, I'll now turn to what has happened in over the past 30 years. In the United States, we had uh, Ben Bernanke in uh, uh, 1994 wrote this uh, sorry, 2004, wrote this famous paper about we've entered the era of the great moderation, the economies are much more stable, who can we thank? Basically central banks. Central banks uh, have figured out how to operate monetary policy in a way that we've achieved essentially permanent stability. 
And this uh, reminds anyone who remembers the, the Great Depression and Irving Fisher's proclamation in September of 1929 that the stock markets had reached a permanent plateau and we're never going to have another uh, crash. And one month later, we had October 1929. Exactly the, the same sort of thing. So anyway, the argument was that uh, I won't go through each one of these things, but we've had a, a, a number of um, developments that have made the capitalist system much more stable. Minsky died in 1996, so he didn't live to see this, uh, this paper and the development of the argument. We had reached the era of the great moderation, but he had a nice way of putting uh, these sorts of statements. He says, it's a radical suspension of disbelief, and that is the belief that you might be wrong, okay? So in the um, late 80s until his death, Minsky returned to the financial instability hypothesis and he transformed it into an explanation of these longer term transformations of the uh, capitalist system, which he says is fundamentally a financial system. Uh, I won't go through the, the stages. First, we had commercial capitalism, 19th century. Finance capitalism, that is what collapsed into the Great Depression. Uh, paternalistic, managerial, welfare state uh, capitalism. Uh, which the United States and the European countries and the UK all adopted as a result of the Great Depression um, was gradually transformed into money manager capitalism. Many other people have noticed this sort of a transformation. It goes by a number of different names, but I think that um, Minsky added to the description of the kind of capitalism we have um, in his uh, writings where he identified it as uh, a kind of capitalism in which we have huge pools of money, such as pension funds, under professional management. Each pool managed by somebody who has to beat the average return. And how do you beat the average return? By increasing risk, okay? And so we had stability, breeding, instability, a huge accumulation of assets and liabilities, globalization, securitization, and the movement uh, some people call it uh, deregulation, but it's better to call it self-supervision. The idea that the biggest financial institutions are so complex, so sophisticated, government cannot possibly regulate and supervise them, so we have to allow them to supervise themselves. If we look at the, the crises over uh, the last 30 years, what we notice is that they are not crises of investment, okay? They, we had the U.S. Thrift and bank uh, crisis. We had the whoops, LDC debt crisis, LBO, the new economy, Nasdaq, tw the 2000s residential real estate, and the commodities market. Boom and bust. None of these fit the financial instability hypothesis. They do fit Minsky's uh, discussion of the transformation of the capitalist economy. Okay. They're increasingly frequent, and each crisis is worse than the previous one, and it is harder to rescue the financial system. It takes a bigger and bigger effort each time to rescue the financial system in, in order to try to save it. So what I've been arguing is, uh, Paul McCauley famously called it the Minsky moment uh, when the crisis hit, the global financial crisis. I think we should look at it as a Minsky half century. It was a 50-year transformation of the capitalist system until we finally had the huge um, crash. Um, Adair Turner yesterday talked about the, the tremendous growth of debt. So here's the debt to GDP ratio for the United States. You can see uh, the last time we had a peak uh, in the, the Great Depression, we reached three times GDP. We reached five times GDP this time around. But what I wanted to point out is uh, Adair Turner also mentioned financial institutions owing other financial institutions. This was almost zero in the early post-war period. It grew to 125% of GDP. This is a very good measure of financialization, where financial institutions are financing their positions in assets not by issuing deposits, but by issuing liabilities to other financial institutions. Okay, and if 
a financial institution gets in trouble, the troubles spread extremely quickly through the whole financial system because they all owe each other. Now here, really this is done by the biggest banks. Okay, this is not really done by, in the U United States we have 4,500 banks, the, the bottom 95% uh, of those don't do this stuff at all. Okay, this is the biggest banks owing the uh, other big banks. Um, I'm going to skip this one. People have noticed that um, this growing instability and the growing debt is also related to the falling wage share. The depressed wages, which uh, in the United States have not grown in real terms since 1974, um, while labor productivity, uh, Rick Wolf has a very nice graph that shows this, labor productivity has continued growing on trend, but real wages have been absolutely constant. We have a gap opening up. So the question is, how can firms sell a growing output to a population whose wages are not growing in real terms? And the only way that they can do this is by lending to them so that they can buy the output. So it's not a surprise that we find rising inequality, a stagnant wage share, rising profits, and growing debt, especially consumer debt. Those, th those things all must be linked. So we've had debt-fueled consumption and a rising share of the financial sector because, of course, growing debt means more fees and more interest flowing to the financial system. It's another aspect of financialization. So here's another picture which just shows the profit share growing relative to GDP. I could show you the flip side, which would be the wage share is falling as a percent of GDP. But notice it is especially financial profits <laughs> that are growing as a share of GDP. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to show you. But if you, uh, if you don't know this graph, this is Wynn Godley. Uh, this is the most important uh, graph that you will ever see in macroeconomics. Okay? It's, it's, you can't see it. It's the three balances. Well, there's something you can see from your chair, which is that it's a mirror image. Okay? There are, there's a positive above zero and a negative below zero. Balances do balance. <coughs> so this is showing this. Yeah, she's telling me two minutes. So I'm not going to be able to explain this, but if you don't know this, you need to know this. Go to the, the Levy website, look at papers by Minsk, uh, sorry, by Wynn Godley. And <clears throat> in the late 90s, Wynn Godley was warning the global financial crisis is coming, okay? With this graph, you could see it happening because you could see the private sector spending more than its income, spending $1.06 for every dollar of income, and the government sector running a budget surplus. Those two things had to be linked and it had to lead to a financial crisis. Okay, <clears throat> uh, let me just finish with um, a very brief summary of uh, Minsky's uh, policy proposals. <coughs> so capitalism is dynamic and comes in many forms. The 1930s reforms were appropriate for the 1930s and they gave us a very stable period, the golden era of capitalism. Okay, and the golden era of global growth, too. The longest period without a major financial crisis. The United States went from World War II until 1966 with no financial crises. Okay, we had never done that before. The problem is that we need new policies now. We can't, it's not a matter of just going back and getting the New Deal reforms. We need new policies to deal with the new situation. We have to reform the financial system because, as Minsky said, a capital system is a financial system. And so you have to start there, but you need more than that. Uh, we need a revised view of finance. The conventional view is that banks intermediate savings, Modigliani, Miller theorem, and efficient markets hypothesis tell us that finance doesn't matter, that it's neutral. Okay, nothing could be further from the truth. Capitalism is a financial system. We need a different view. Saving doesn't finance anything. The finance is created simultaneously with the debts. 
it's best to think of finance as keystrokes rather than as being intermediated saving. Financialization is not finance. So what we have had is financialization, and everyone thinks that's been a good thing because they view that as increasing the supply of finance, which must be a good thing because it is providing finance for economic activities. But actually, all it's done is leveraged activities. It's put, it, put, the, uh, put more and more debt. We have $5 of debt in the United States for every dollar of economic activity, okay? And that is financialization. So I have to stop. Thanks.